Kia ora. Some wise person said that history is just one damn thing after another. And I've been looking at the history of the Ark in the Park, which is now a quarter of a century old. Quarter of a century. Let's not talk about years, it sounds better when we talk about fractions of a century. But the genesis of the Ark in the Park uh, is from 1999. And um, it started, I was running from Pihar through to Karikari along the coast. And just thinking about the Forest and Bird magazines, which had changed from being the best magazine in the world of doom. This species going down, that species succumbing. And suddenly they started talking about this concept called the mainland island, where we started seeing our species recovering multiple trapping and baiting regimes that allowed the native species to, to live, survive, and sometimes even flourish. So by the time I came back from Kaurikauri on the run, I'd come up with the name The Ark in the Park, I'd come up with our logo, I just got the situation wrong, but we'll talk about that later. I'd thought we'd do the, um, the southernmost part of the Waitakere, you had the Tasman Sea, you had the harbour, we'd just triangulate it and that would be that. Of course it's the steepest and the most inaccessible bit of the Waitakere, so luckily wiser heads prevailed. Um, our Forest and Bird branch approved of the idea. Many people in the past have thought of having some uh, better uh, haven for our wildlife here. Uh, we held a scientific meeting at Arutaki. Uh, we had Jim Lynch, the founder of uh, Karori. He was there. David Butler, uh, who ran the mainland island at Lake Rotuiti, and some others. Uh, we then formed a combined committee with members from our forest and bird branch, John Stanland here was one, uh, we had members from the Waitakere Rangers Protection Society and we discussed things like should we have a fence, where would we put it, visions that we had were you know, enjoying the dawn chorus, perhaps getting saddlebacks, perhaps even recreating Moa or Huia to come in. Um, Rob Small who was then the um, uh, parks, uh, head of parks for the ARC, uh, suggested we didn't need to build up a, a new trust as such to organise this, but that we should just join an existing trust that had uh, ties already with the ARC, with uh, Te Kawara Maki, with uh, Waitakere City. And so uh, we joined, uh, we all joined the forest, uh, Friends of Arataki, and that for a few years became the uh, driver of the Ark in the Park project. We got some grants, small grants from the Waitakere Licensing Trust and, and the uh, Waitakere City, enough to buy some uh, pens and pencils and paper and all this sort of stuff and we were underway. We appointed um, a woman from uh, North Shore Forest and Bird, Christine Zyler, to scope out where the Ark in the Park concept should be. and. Um, after looking at about 13 different sites from north to south, came up with the Cascades. It had the infrastructure, it had the roads, the ranger station, toilets. It had uh, the um, a population of long-tailed bats, Hochstetter's frogs. There were kaka visiting. It was um, ecologically, in, you know, the one of the one of the few places in the Waitakere that had an intact forest. So the Cascades was the top, and we started here. Um, January 2002, we put our first traps in on the Pukamatakeo uh, track there and some around the golf course. Um, we then, a few months later, were adding in bait stations and then by December we'd put in our first rat monitoring um, lines. We um, go to page two, having lost it. Um, the ARC. Um, decided after the first year that we were serious about this, they'd let us play around between Tehanga Road and the Pukamato Keo track. And then they saw we were really into it, so they then um, employed a contractor to do the AN block from Pukamato Keo right through to Anderson's. And that um, showed us something, that our navigation was shot. We had managed in sometimes only 400 metres from the road to Pukamato Keo to be as much as 300 metres out for lines that were meant to be parallel. So we had a lot to learn. Um, we therefore revised those first bait stations and lines. We took everything out and restarted again, using as the start line the, um, where the contractor had uh, finished. So we now have uh, parallel lines. 
We also um, believe the doc edict that these you should have a grid, which to me meant the lines are parallel. If you come to a cliff, you go over it. So we put lots of rope in, and there's lots of places in our uh, trap, our bait light station uh, lines, where you use ropes and you go over cliffs. <laughs> I later found out that lots of the dock places that circumnavigate, that go around, which of course left big holes in the um, trapping uh, regime there. Um, by September 03, we um, managed to get the zoo involved. Auckland Zoo came, they had some bait station lines, they did their first, uh, um, they had a rat monitoring line as well. Um, we were getting many volunteers, both locally, I'd gone round to all the tramping clubs and all the res residents and ratepayers, getting lots there. We had Christian Landon, who was the founder of Kokako Coffee, and he used to bring people, he had a, a cart in Aotea Square, and he'd bring all these people who'd come and get coffee, and they'd end up coming out here and doing some work. Um, we had a, our first release just on the paddock over there um, in, two, in September 2004, Whiteheads. Day like this, wonderful. It was really emotional just seeing a translocation. We had our first part-time manager then, Sandra Jack. Uh, council gave her uh, two days to work for the Ark in the Park and the rest she was a ranger at Murawai. We started the buffer zone. We started giving some of the people onto Henga Road and the Scenic Drive uh, bait stations or traps or both as they wanted. Um, we noted the first breeding of Whitehead in March of 2005, but that was on Lone Kauri Road. And uh, that uh, became obvious that these birds dispersed. In fact, two days after our first Whitehead release, a, a Whitehead was seen down at Hunua. So that was one of the problems, that's why we don't see whiteheads here anymore, because they dispersed, and it's hard to mix and mate if you don't find the mate. Um, we started preparing for our second release, uh, second species, and that was uh, Totowai, Robins. Um, Richard Jacob Hoff from the zoo came over with the two or three of us to Makoya Island on Lake uh, Rotorua, and we did some disease screening for some birds we caught and then we arranged a trip later on um, in April and brought back 63 uh, robins from Makoya Island. At this stage we had the first of our international interns. Uh, Uta Langehausen came from Germany and she uh, was looking at the dispersal of these robins and uh, finding out where they were. Interesting with Uta, she then had, uh, became a lecturer at Kiel and sent one of her students about five or six years later. So it was lovely circularity, yeah. Um, robin breeding, we noted in spring. Um, wasps, some of you have had to contend with here. Well, we were the first non-governmental to use fipronil paste. Um, this had been used down in uh, Lake Rotoroa and Rotuiti, uh, most dense uh, population of wasps anywhere in the world, dreadful place. And the fipronil was successful there. We trialled it here as well. Um, we changed from having just one day a week for our volunteers. It was getting difficult organising 40 people to go various places when half of them didn't know where they were going and we were trying to be safety conscious by sending people in pairs. So we thought, right, let's split it, it's easier all round. And so we had two days a week. Um, organised a, a more pork study. Um, people had been concerned we were using at this stage Brodificum and we were using that year round virtually and there was concern that there would be secondary poisoning of the Ruru. Well, we had someone do a summer scholarship study. She looked at 13 sites throughout all of the Waitakeris and found, in fact, we had many more Ruru here than anywhere else in the Waitakeris. So that was very, bit, yeah, very useful bit of information that's been promulgated to other projects there. Um, we then move on to 2007. We released Hihi. Um, we'd had a, a preliminary um, search here by the members of the Hihi Recovery Group and this is ideal forest for Hihi in terms of the uh, plant species that are here. This is the, um, the this, is, this forest here is more uh, species full than anywhere else in New Zealand I think and John did a study uh, in his teaching fellowship year that showed that, that we have all the species that were, were necessary for hihi. Um, and so we had a, a hihi release. Um, we did skink surveys using artificial um, 
cover objects. Then we, um, in that uh, 2008, we had our first full-time manager, Mai, who's sitting behind. Raise your hand, Mai. <laughs> so Mai was with us for quite some time and really, um, I think, really sorted things out so that we were um, accepted by all our funders because Mai organised really good uh, triple-line accounting and uh, so people knew that when we said we'd done something we had, we were trusted uh, recipients of funds. Um, so we had another Cot Robin release in June of 2009, but then in August of 2009, our first Kokako release. And they were released also here, but very soon moved to where we thought it wasn't as good habitat, but that's what they wanted. So they moved then very quickly and subsequently have been mainly around the Cutty Grass track area, north and south of that. That seems to be what they prefer, so that's fine. Um, I was interested in the fact that uh, the Waitakere was one place where striped skink had been found. Skinks are normally on the ground, geckos normally in the trees, but the striped skink is arboreal. And if it was going to be anywhere, it's still up in the top. So I set up a canopy climbing core and we had um, about 20 or 30 people over a few years learn how to go up the ropes. We put up black tracker tunnels there. We did find some occasional lizard prints. We did get the occasional um, reflection of the eyes of lizards, but didn't find uh, any striped skinks. Uh, and then, because of events that occurred later, which all of you are aware of, we had to disband the canopy climbing. By 2014, we found that there were twice as many birds in the Ark area compared with a um, comparative area, which was around the Fairy Falls. So things were looking good. Still getting lots of uh, students, uh, um, overseas students. Also, Unitech was sending students for um, uh, some of their studies here, and lots of volunteers were joining. Um, so, by 2019, in fact, um, the survey showed there were 63 kokako around within the ark and around the ark. The year before, there'd been 40. Then we had a mast year, the first of many, with dreadful rat stats. So whereas in the early years we'd been generally 5% or certainly under 10% rat index, and to put that in context, where we'd have these rat monitoring tunnels, where we've done the baiting and the poisoning, we wanted to be less than 10%. Out beyond where there's no baiting or poisoning uh, or trapping, uh, you'd get 80 or 90%. So... But in that year, 13% um, 13 in February, up to 34% in July, and slightly less in December. So we've tried new traps, um, wasn't successful. We've tried new baits, but because these baits required pre-feeding and we generally had to put more out each time, the council uh, enabled us, or perhaps it was us also, who raised the funds for contractors to do this. It was more difficult up to then. Volunteers had gone out and done all the bait laying and the trapping. Kauri dieback was the next problem. So that, one, it put pay to the canopy climbing, um, but two, it really restricted um, how we could go around and there were all sorts of constraints put on us. Initially, we couldn't go in at all, but it was realised that just to maintain what we'd already done, we needed to be able to get in. So it was things like boot cleaning, it was things like wearing surgical overshoes over your boots, removing those when you went past a cowrie block, putting on another pair of overshoes to the in the next cowrie you came upon, and so on. Um, I'm jumping here, so then the next problem of course was COVID and that restricted us once again. But that um, is a bit of an over history, one damn thing after another, of those first several years of uh, the Ark in the Park. I'm going to hand it over now I think to Eduardo who is going to talk about some more recent uh, events.